Welcome to the bilge pumps, where a bunch of drips spout ship. Hello, and welcome to bilge pumps. Now, today is a slightly different one. We're going to be using Battlestar Galactica Deadlock, or as Jamie will probably shortly be correcting me, the universe of Battlestar Galactica, to look at current naval developments and see if we can sort out some of the problems by using science fiction which as me and Drac occasionally wind up with Jamie it tends to be based in naval history anyway so um is this actually going to the forward to le- going to the future to learn from the past a lot of militaries at the moment are sort of taking the line that um science fiction is a wonderful way to prepare yourself for the, the the changes that are going to be coming at you in the future. The, the, the pace of change is very fast and we need to adapt our thinking. Science fiction is a very um, useful channel to do that. I'm not entirely convinced personally, but what does science f- fiction do? Does it produce uh, Zumwalt and the um, littoral combat ship or does it produce radar and heat rays? Or does it do both? We're told that science fiction can be inspiring and useful for future military thinking. Okay, let's put it to the test. Very quickly, Battlestar Galactica Deadlock is a computer game which has a nice feature of video playback. So after you've actually played the game, it gives you a cinematic. The Battlestar Galactica is defined by its very, I suppose it's common now, but at the time it was a little bit more, um, a little bit more original. Humans versus robots, or humans versus AI. You know, when you're talking AI versus um, human nowadays, it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as rosy as it used to be. No, but that's also because in many ways we're imbuing AI with a lot of the things that we have. And when we're looking at computers, we are thinking about them as us. But honestly, the first point I think is an AI turns on us the idea is always that it sees us as its greatest threat. Well, hopefully you program in that it actually is supposed to look after us. AI, even now, is being weaponized. It's yeah. being built for the purpose of warfare. And that's why the 1978 Battle Cycle Galactica, uh, the original race was actually a bunch of lizard people, slash Illuminati, I suppose, mm-hmm. who um, you know, uh, built these warm Cylon war machines to do the fighting for them. So that is one know, of the backstories. There's also a more recent backstory where it's actually yes. the humans themselves who build the Cylons. That's right. In which way you've got, you know, we just had the um, US Air Force, the um, AI in an F-16 that actually had its turning uh, learning ability turned off for the p- purpose of the combat um, series versus, you know, a, a pretty decent test pilot. Mm-hmm. And AI won 10 to 0. So, you know, here we are clunking around in F-16s um, with a you know, bolt-in um, AI. And when it came to the dogfight, 10-0. And that's only, and that's, you know, 2020. So, uh, you know, I'm not Don't really take the sure. strong way, Jamie, but I would ask you, what were the rules of that particular exercise? So I, I you guess, see, this, you know, this is the thing. Because we all know the exercise, and uh, uh, this sounds terrible, but... How often do we hear exercises, and Drac has this great joke about F-15s, where one week the F-15 is this all-conquering, all-dancing aircraft of the skies, and then next week it's lost the battle against whatever. MiG-21s. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is the, the, I worry about military exercises, especially today. I worry about how often things seem to be... There aren't many exercises which take place which don't seem to have the end result already worked out before they begin. Uh, I mean, I don't deny that's happening. Um, And we all know that that sort of happened in the 1930s 
with aircraft versus the 1920s, aircraft versus battleships. Uh, you know, the aircrafts performed surprisingly well in some instances and terribly poorly in other instances because, frankly, they didn't know how they would really perform. Therefore, the simulations um, basically produced whatever the attitude of the uh, game designer was. The war games taught the US, Japan and Britain on one hand that you get the first strike in, you win when it comes to carrier combat. But it, it concealed the effectiveness of dive bombing. And these things all immediately became apparent I would, in the uh, first, day, first weeks of the war. I, I would disagree, concealed from the Navy, the, the, the arguments of dive bombing. Dive bombing also runs into trouble because the Air Force doesn't want to get into dive bombing because they're worried then they'll be relegate, uh, rele, uh, relegated to just supporting the Army or supporting the Navy and they'll lose out on the heavy bomber battle. So that's why the dive bombing doesn't but get that applies the coverage to, in Britain to, as it does. That applies to the RAF, but you know, um, even with um, the US Navy, the dive bombers were seen more as a... Uh, something that you've got your scout bombers to do yeah. in support, as opposed to being specifically a dive bomber as being your primary weapon. Um, but fairly quickly, they learned that the torpedo bomber was much harder to get through, to deliver its payload safely and to get out again. And um, it was the dive bombers that were the... Although, as the British showed, when the, di when the torpedo bomber hit, it hit hard. <laughs> yes. But uh, again, so it's the, the danger of war games is, of course, how, how real can they get? But the, 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 I think there's very little doubt that um, artificial intelligence is blindingly fast at learning. The, mm. the um, AI had already fought these battles. It had a lot of experience in three-dimensional air combat in the F-16. So it knew how to optimise the aircraft's performance. And it could project ahead, whereas a pilot is relying much more on instinct and um, muscle memory. Mm. But I think to an extent um, that we are possibly mislabeling the machine because what is instinct but your prior experience that, uh, combined with the information of what's happening now? And that's what an AI is. It's get, it, when you're saying it's going through all the permanent innovations, it's developing an instinct. Mm -hmm. And that's yes, right. And, well, we, we, yes. and I look forward to the human human AI hybrids, the cyborgs, which <laughs> one day rule us. Um, I am sure they're coming. But leaving that to one side, there is this sort of, you get to a point where you go, okay, so we have this knowledge that AI wins all these fights. And it's a bolt-in AI that does that. So my question is, when are you going to make all your humans redundant and replace them with AIs? Because if you if it's working so well and it, it's is so brilliant, it's winning 10 out of 10 0 in all the fights, even without learning the opposition. And you've got it already, so you can bolt it into F-16s. Why are you, A, building a whole load of F-35s? Why not just build a whole load of F-16s, keep journeying them, add in all this bolt-in AI, and let it go play? Because what's going to win? And it doesn't matter if they're not as stealthy as the F-35, because if they die, you've just lost an AI. You've got no parent. You're not going to write to Mrs. Zero, Mrs. One, um, um, you know, or Mr. One and Mrs. Zero and go, we are so sorry. Your, 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 your a zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one died today. You don't have to worry about it. If it works so well, why haven't they done this? Because apparently it is winning fights. I think, I think a lot of it comes down to with AIs. And I think this is the difference between <coughs> what, we might call an AI these days, um, which is, as I say, kind of as a machine learning, almost an advanced ver version of a machine learning algorithm, and a true AI, as you see in sci-fi, which can think and adapt the same way as a human, in all, well, in almost the same way as a human can, because with, with a current AI, it's only as smart as the person who programmed it. That's um, where I agree. Yeah, that, that's actually no longer really correct, as I understand it, because they can teach 
themselves. Mm. They can yeah. they, they can be pointed in a direct the, the human programmer points them in a direction. And the human programmer exposes them mm. to the experiences that they want to guide that learning. Yeah. But the actual machine mm. learning process, the algorithm itself, is constantly rewriting its own algorithm. Mm. So this is how you know the, the Facebook algorithm, how the Google algorithms are so fast and efficient now. This is this is why you can carry around in your phone mm. a device, a, a piece of software, an app that will do an on-the-fly translation, because the algorithm has written itself and rewritten itself to be more become more and more efficient over time that it, it now fits on an app. Now, yes, it only does that one job, but it got to that point of being so small and so mm. efficient through repetition at you know um, supercomputer speeds. But I think what, what, what I mean by sort of as smart as the programmer is that you know, like even with those sort of limited AIs where they're, they're operating, as you say, within a box where there's only a certain number of possible outcomes, so in theory they can learn them all, the pro the initial program and the written and like the limits set by the programmer but and also the the way it learns is initially is set by the programmer and the amount and the data it's pointed at is also set by a human and those can have big limitations on algorithms i mean obviously there is also cost cutting these days which is another issue um but if you think about a a map based ai if i were to down well if i use the internal sat nav on my car and i use google maps on my phone and someone else uses apple maps on their iphone the, in theory they've all got access to the same data but if you if i ask them to all to take me to portsmouth or plymouth they'll actually give me three different answers because they're three different programs written to do the same thing with as i say in theory access to the same data but they've been written by three different programmers with slightly different biases, strengths and weaknesses. And so you end up with one that might take you in the route that you want to be taken, uh, that's actually quite efficient. Another might say that this other route is much faster, but they it'll do something really stupid, like take you down a farm lane, because whoever's programmed it has just told it to consider everything that's marked as a road on this map without any bias as to what that road actually is whereas someone else had been smart enough to tell them actually you don't want to send people down farm tracks and this is why you get people like trucks following sat navs ending up smashing into bridges or getting stuck in narrow roads because the ai is doing the best job it can but it's 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 hampered by the original programmer who didn't tell that that ai that a narrow road is actually a bad idea for certain vehicles uh, and and things like that. So you'll have these blind spots that, that will develop in into an AI based on who programmed it and what strengths and weaknesses they had. And I think also there's a degree of um, it's it's the available data. It's like an AI can or machine learning they can learn from the available data. But if you throw a new situation at them, um, it's a computer program at least at the moment, obviously a, a, a true AI, as you see in Battlestar Galacta, wouldn't have this so much as, as a problem or else it would just be doing it a lot quicker. But a modern AI, if it doesn't have a database to work from, it's going to be very confused. It's going to make some very rough approximations with its initial decision cycles. And that will, in a combat situation, will probably get it killed. I mean, if you take, like, like let's say the realm of air combat, if you train your F6, AI F-16, you can train it against an F-35, an F-22, a Typhoon, um, uh, an F-15, F-A-18, whatever, Rapal maybe. You might be able to give it some data about a J-20 or a Pack F A or whatever model of Sukhoi they're calling it nowadays. But you can't give it everything because you don't know that data. And if you don't know that data, the AI doesn't know that data. And if, um, I don't know, if the if the Chinese are working on some super secret sixth generation stealth fighter and the AI flown F-16 shows up and this magical sixth generation stealth fighter shows up, assuming they even see it coming, a human pilot would immediately go, okay, it's a new aircraft, but I can still do this. And a human pilot can intuit potential countermeasures 
and very quickly learn and adapt the more and more information he ta he takes in extrapolating off other things that he knows a kind of almost very sort of multi-track way of thinking whereas an ai will look at it and go i have no idea what this is i don't know what to do it will immediately start building a database based on what's it, what it's seeing as to what it might be able to do but if the first thing it sees is this thing coming in and it's pulling a turn it doesn't really have a lot more to to go on at which point it will go well i i think maybe it can do this it'll try and before maybe an evasive action and it turns out actually that's completely wrong but by the time that that occurs that's it I and mean, you, you see these kind of errors i mean even in, in really basic things like the youtube algorithm for example uh probably all three of us have experienced this youtube boasts about its algorithm having i mean how many videos has you the, the algorithm had a chance to review it's got billions upon billions of hours of machine learning it still screws up all the time and flags perfectly fine naval history videos and says oh, i don't believe this content is appropriate for advertisers when <laughs> yes. it turns out every time it goes to human to manual review a human goes what on earth are you talking about you moronic machine um <laughs> yes and and it, it and this is the thing it's with a for, for a human you might have a degree of confirmation bias but but a human can kind of revisit the decision they made previously my I, I troll where... video on force k got mm. flagged for pornography yeah you got uh, i've had i've had far right content chucked me and far like the left content and the, all these sort of things that are said to me are basically from youtube but uh, i would i went through the force k uh, before uh, it uploaded so this is inappropriate content due to pornography i went what in the name of <laughs> Yeah, and then, and this is things like if 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 well a, a human is less likely to make that kind of mistake because the human mind is a bit more capable of that kind of parallel thinking, but also say because humans can revisit their previous decisions many steps back very quickly, and realize they have to do something different, as opposed to a machine which will go like like with these flags, it'd be like this is a new situation. I think I should do this, and once it's decided that this is the best thing to do. At the moment, at least, machine learning algorithms are almost they're the worst kind of ideologues. If you if you want to have a human equivalent, because like no, I've made this decision. This is the best decision. I'm going down this road, come hell or high water, because I I have determined that this decision I made earlier is fine, and everything else is now in the context of this. Um, at which point you end up with all sorts of weird things happening. But as I say, it's that that's a difference between what we've got now and what, what? A true AI as battle saga actor or as may happen in 10 15 years time I, i've always said i will start to get worried about ai the, the day that i see an ai learn to you know learn to wire and plug in its own plug <laughs> once once it once they can do that we're dead <laughs> um, but look the, the, the thing is is that you know we're already starting to see this now okay so ai is being used in places like hong kong to track the movement of dissidents you know, and in just China in general and elsewhere where they've sold their technology to. So we're already seeing um, jewelry, earrings, makeup, hats, shirts that have different forms of composition that disrupt the senses, that break up their shape, that distort mm. the, the mm. feedback. So we're getting camouflage. Dazzle too. camouflage is so good. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, does this mean we'll be seeing camouflage warships? I hope so, because they'd be so much prettier than the current ones. Because, but, you know, it, it's, it's the same thinking. A, an AI is, so the thinking in World War One was, okay, let's paint these ships so that you can't determine its direction clearly. Uh, aircraft carriers were painted in ways to make them try and look like they were two separate vessels in some cases. Um, there's no reason why you can't try and do that same thing with an AI. problem, of course, is, is that as soon as you do it, someone notices it, and then goes and trades the AI to counteract it. Now that process is now it is, would, would happen quite quickly. So basically, every time a ship puts to sea, it would have to go out with a different composition of camouflage, not just in terms of the, the um, pattern, but also in terms of the materials used for the for the disruption. Um, you know, it's I, I don't think that. Um, but are you thinking perhaps bad. necessarily the right thing? Because couldn't you do the same, get the same effect with a whole load of LEDs, etc.? I was about to say this camouflage sponsored by Amazon Kindle. Just put <laughs> a bunch of, uh, of of low power OLEDs on. 
or, or equivalent on your ship have an active camouflage so you yeah. you can you leave harbor as a lovely slate gray warship where everyone can see you and then the minute you're over the horizon it's like and today i'm wearing dazzle camouflage number one <laughs> and tomorrow i will wear dazzle camouflage number two but of course the, 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 the thing is is that the with you know, the modern sensors you need to have that working at different levels it would need to work yeah, it's infrared, thermal it to work and everything at, yeah yeah um but it's it's still something that you would you would hope or you would expect an AI to not have the intuition to overcome a confused or mixed message, hmm. um, whereas a human looking at it would just laugh. Hmm. That's yeah, the I think point. This, this is the thing. Why, with, as you say, with like all the disruptive pattern clothing for for stopping AI cameras tracking you. At the, uh, and I think this is the thing. It's the the difference at the moment and the thing that separates current AI tech from the kind of Battlestar Galactica style AI tech is the ability to intuit conclusions rather than just base it on a pure stream of learning because a, a, a machine and to a certain degree, I think it's also part, part of it is the difficulty that even humans have of communicating just what it is that makes up our reasoning <laughs> because mm. the programmer, he knows what a human is. But he's now got to try and describe what a human is to the machine so that the machine can go, ah, oh, I recognize this as a human. So if you tell the machine, well, a human is like approximately this tall and has four limbs and a head and moves in roughly this manner, then as soon as you put all sorts of weird dazzle stripey camouflage stuff on you that makes you not look like a continuous shape that might matches that description, um, the machine just goes, well, that's not a human because I've been told that a human is this and I'm not seeing this. Whereas a human, just uh, an actual human would just look at it and go, that's another human wearing stripy cl clothes. Um, it, because we understand mm. there's a lot more that we understand about what is a human than basic shape and movement data. Um, but it's like, ha here, how do you describe, how do you tell a machine that this thing based, that it's visually seeing, because it's only working on visual sensors usually, um, how do you tell it that this is why this is a human, even though it looks to you like it isn't? And the uh, trouble is, when you tell it it isn't a human, you tell them that that yeah. isn't human, then it starts getting a lot, whole lot of false positives because there's all sorts mm. of things it sees which look like that, but which aren't humans. Yeah, it's, it's this, it's then, this then absolute one. That much data. Yeah. And, it's the absolute one zero of nature. It either is or isn't a thing. Whereas the with for actual human reasoning, you can go, it may be a thing, or it may not. And it's interesting so where they say that humans think so in this, trinary rather than binary. There's this, plus this, one, is, this zero is why I'm thinking most one. of our this is why I'm thinking most of our politicians have been taken over by robots. Mm. Yeah, no, robots would be doing the better job. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, the robots would learn from their mistakes. Machine learning <laughs> does learn from mistakes over time. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm guessing that um, you know this would also rule out the prospect of robotic boarding parties for the immediate future well you see the thing is i would say a robotic boarding party it depends what you're talking about if you're talking we're about having in battle cycle we're, we're, we're seeing uh, you know the the humanoid robots in their breaching pods mm -hmm. attach themselves to the hull of a ship burn their yep. way through and start shooting their way down the corridors against the marines I could see them maybe do, those sort of things happening. I could see robots being used to assist and uh, assist marine boarding parties. I could certainly see them start being functioning because there is a whole gap between us going entirely robotic boarding parties mm. and actually going, you know what? What we could have is a human led but robot, a, a robot mass boarding party. Because the big trouble, if you're looking at Western nations at the moment, it's getting enough people. It's getting and recruiting enough trained strength. And this is really what they're trying to fill the gap in because people are expensive and you've got cultures which are risk adverse. So if you have a boarding party and you go, right then, uh, OK, so we've got four sailors slash marines, whatever, a part of the boarding party. Oh, and you guys are you're going to be supplemented by four xr 40s with machine with their machine guns and each one of them is basically designated as your bodyguard oh and you're also going to have four flying probes which will go around and map out information ahead of you and make sure you're going down routes that they already know are clear fine 
I can see that working out as quite a sensible thing. You Until know? the first wave breaks over the bow. To, to be honest, I, though, I can, I can see... Well, you'd hope you build them so they're sort of waterproof. You'd hopefully. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I can see robot boarding parties actually probably being one of the first things you might come up with because, from a, again, from a machine perspective, it's very, it's, it's very much easier because it's a closed environment. There, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of fairly hard limitations, like you're not going to find random crewmen on the ship you're boarding floating over the ocean it's like we're in an enclosed environment they're on the ship it, there are certain rules about ship construction you're not going to find like a mm. 45 degree slope running all the way along the length of the ship or something like that um and on a ship humans are actually relatively easy to distinguish from the rest of the ship to be perfectly <laughs> honest and and again also there's a lot less there's no and this is one of the major issues with current uh, computers and AIs is there's no real risk of friendly casualties because if you're boarding a hostile ship, by definition, everybody on that ship is hostile. The only the only question for the robot boarding party is, do we shoot them or do we let them surrender? Um, and you can make a robot that because humans have all this extraneous stuff that needs protecting. Um, that isn't necessarily relevant to a combat mission, which that's, is what a boarding action is. A robot, you can just make it to run for an hour or so with a machine gun and basically make it a rolling, walking, scuttling, whatever you want to make it, um, armored machine gun with a, with a few vi heavily armored visual sensors, at which point it can be a lot more forgiving in, in terms of its rules of engagement. Because if you're a person, you break in, like if you want to say, I don't know, get onto the bridge, you have to do the whole dynamic entry, pan you, panning your gun around, screaming at everyone to get down, et cetera. Very high tension situation because if someone fires back at you, there's a very high chance that you're going to be wounded or killed. If you've got what's effectively, I don't know, a, a eight legged walking brick with a machine gun on it, um, it doesn't care whether or not the people on the bridge are going to resist or small, with small arms fire or not because it's pretty much immune to that. So it can quite happily just scuttle up onto the bridge. So you are being liberated. Please do not resist. And if they do resist, that's like, oh, ah, that's nice of you. Now, are you going to stop resisting or do I have to shoot you? It's got a lot more latitude of action at that point than a, than a human boarding party would. Um, so I think in, in that respect, actually, you, yeah, robotic boarding parties would definitely be a thing I could see happening, especially if you've got a human remote view where you can maybe have an emergency override if it does go completely haywire and decide that everybody is a threat and needs to burn, um, <laughs> which programming glitches uh, might occur. Um, yes. You know, there's a whole warning, communism detected on American soil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, God. Well, one, one, one element of um, the computer game as opposed to the um, uh, televised, television universes mm -hmm. Uh, is the use of damage control drones. So these are used to repair or replace armor in the game, which is just mm -hmm. you know, naturally based on the, the point sort of system that these games work on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, the prospect of robotic slash drone slash automated repair systems. Mm. Um, again, I'm thinking what. Uh, the arguments that you apply here is uh, you can't really predict damage. So how do you no, give, but how do you give you, an AI, especially maybe especially an independently operating AI unit, because you mm. can't rely on the fact that a central onboard AI processor is still functional. How do you how do you get a astro what do I, what do I call them astro droid mm. the, um, the uh, from Star Wars to Astromax. actually function? Yeah, to to, to function in, a, in on a warship. Well, I think well, that, would, that would be a case of, in a lot of ways, I think it would be a case of machine learning sim similar to how you actually train actual damage control crews. You, you, you'd put it through a bunch of simulations that would teach it m most, if not all, the permutations of basic damage control. And then, um, and, and, and kind of, yeah, and then as you get more experience with ships and everything, I think this, this, this is kind of the wonderful thing about these kinds of of uses for, for AI and drones is that once you once one of them has experienced it, it can share that experience with all of them pretty much. Which, which also applies to the F-16 versus the sixth, yeah. sixth generation Chinese fighter. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, it'll be like it the, the first dozen will die horribly, but the thirteenth might have a decent chance of fighting back. The qu- I think the difference is that if you're if you're doing air to air combat, the first dozen dying horribly might then mean that that fighter gets in launch range of something you really would rather it didn't. Um, at which point, the fact that the next time you encounter it, you can shoot it down, doesn't really change the fact you lost that engagement. Whereas with damage control, yeah, it's, you can run it through endless tests and simulations. And every time, a, every time something, one of its me- brethren gets experience, the entire fleet now knows how to deal with that and learns more. And to be fair, if, like if you've got a bunch of them on your ship, if you've got some really weird damage going on, if you send one of them in, it can try and do its best. And even if it somehow gets damaged or destroyed or fails, the next one that you send in has a better chance. Um, and if they network, they can pool their resources and come up with better decisions faster. But I actually think, dam- again, damage control is actually a very good good one, especially for modern ships, because um, whilst I haven't done it full-on damage control training, I've seen it occur. Yeah. And, yeah, if you've got a high, like a high-pressure water jet coming through the side of your ship because someone's poked a hole in it very unkindly, there's only a certain amount that a human can do because you stand in front of a high enough pressure or high enough volume water jet, it's either going to cut you in half or send you flying across the room. Um, and trying trying to get a wooden wedge in, it's like, yeah, you can get a bunch of you and try and wedge a two by four in, but there's a there's a limit to what you can do in that respect. There's a there's a reason why at some point it's like there's no point in trying everyone out with sealing the bulkheads, because that's the best we can do. A machine that's made of mostly metal and steel, A, is going to be a lot more resistive to that kind of thing. It's like human flesh is weak. <laughs> um, <laughs> channeling the Adeptus Mechanicus there. But it's like if if you've got a high pressure jet of water coming in from a hole 20 foot below the water line, um, a human damage control party might not be able to do anything about it because if they touch it, they're going to lose a hand. And if they try and somehow get a wooden wedge in there, the spray is just going to cut their arms off. A machine made of metal has much higher tolerances for that kind of thing. And simultaneously, if you make it kind of the sort of classic sci-fi industrial type machine with heavy hydraulic powered arms, it can probably, whereas a human would have to look at a rip in the hull and think, well, how can we possibly wedge some wood and then some more wood and some more wood and some more wood to adapt to the size of the hull? Hole, a machine with sufficient strength can probably just go, I am going to punch this hole and punch most of the bits that are bent in back into shape. And then I'm going to grab a big slab of like a slab of like a two, two foot by two foot black block of steel. And I'm just going to slam this in place and I'm going to hold it in place against the flow of the water. And now I'm going to use my, my fourth on the fourth arm, my welding torch. I'm just going to weld it into place and that's done. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to punch the ship back to hell. <laughs> Where it, I guess the, you know, the, the challenge of course is building them. Mm. Uh, giving them a decent um, power pack and yeah. making them small enough to operate on a ship. So I guess, again, those are more technical issues that are an engineering mm. issues than um, conceptual issues, aren't they? So that's yeah. the sort of thing that, yeah, it could well be worth thinking about, but um, I guess it's not necessarily going to be appearing in the next decade. No. But, but, you I mean, never this know. It depends. To... How, how bad does the Manning get? Crisis get? I mean, this also goes back to kind of the um, the what we were talking about. Of one of the earliest episodes, of Bilge pumps about potential armored exoskeleton for damage control, because it has mm. most of the durability and strength advantages. But effectively, you're replacing the the AI core with a human who does all the decision making for you. Um, but those kind of two elements can could coalesce if you can get if you can get a human fitting exoskeleton damage control unit to work well enough with a human running it then you over time as you work that element you'll solve the issues of fitting down the corridors making sure it's got enough power etc etc and then at some point you'll arrive at a point where your ai is capable enough to actually run it without a human sitting in it at which point you could probably actually make it smaller and more compact because we have all these annoying things like lungs. Um, <laughs> completely yeah. unnecessary for damage control, really. They are, they are. I have to admit that. I, I cannot, you know, fight that one. They are unnecessary <laughs> for damage control. In fact, you can always say they get pro- they cause problems for damage control. Mm. One theme that sort of is emphasis- that comes through 
um, Battlepsychalactica, both of them as a bit of a mm. subtext really is analog versus digital. So even the original series, the ship was old, it was, you know, man, a lot of the components were manual, where yeah. you, even then you would have expected them to be all automated. The new one, the same thing, they had the old style power operated telephone lines through the ship instead mm. of digital systems. And, um, you know, the, the, the premise of the, the, the second series or the reimagining was, of course, that they, they relaxed their guard, introduced all these high um, capacity navigational computers, which were then you know, easily hacked and took out the ability of the, uh, the, the fleet to defend itself. Mm. Is there a place for that kind of old fashioned hardwired equipment in modern militaries where digital warfare is, is, is such a threat? Mm. And is it going to take a disaster of that sort of scale for, for us to realize it? Or is the difference between the efficiency of digital and the um, foibles of analog so extreme that no, that's just fantasy. I, th well, I think to an extent we're probably seeing it already because not necessarily on the battlefield, but if you think about the really high security data centers um, and and other governmental and even to a certain extent private corporate installations, and actually even to to a lesser degree, even people like ourselves. If a possibility exists that you can remotely access something, someone inevitably at some point will try. Um, that might not happen in my or your lifetimes when it comes to our personal machines, but even then that's why we have internet security systems, but people can mm -hmm. work to overcome them. And on a national level, if you've got the plans for the F-35 and you happen to leave them in a way that is accessible to Chinese beat hackers, suddenly you find gigabytes of data disappearing off of servers. So a lot of the more secure, sensitive servers these days are what they call air-gapped. They just physically don't have an internet connection and they don't have any kind of wireless connection capability there. The, like they're, they're standalone computers of a style that we would all recognize from the 1990s. You can't hack those because you can't access them. You could be standing right next to it with the world's most powerful wireless transmitter, but if the computer's too dumb to be able to talk to you in that manner, um, yeah. If you've got, but if you've got this, uh, the, these air gap machines, you physically can't hack them, and that that's where you keep your secure data. I mean, but I mean, it's like even even for me, it's like the the digital archive content of all my videos. I keep on a um, remote a portable hard drive which sits on on a shelf and is only yeah exactly and is only connected to my computer when i'm backing it up same here and that's fact, i've got two of them because mm. i future proof and i keep one thing and one set of stuff on one and one set of stuff on the other yeah so we we, we like we just there is a perfect example of the 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 an, analog solution if you like the non-network solution and I think this is going to be this is actually going to be a major decision point for a lot of militaries going forward because they're going to be trading off um, data density versus functionality because you can have a wonderful network warfare system where everything talks to everything else and you have all the possible information. But the minute if you've got that, you've then got hundreds, if not thousands of potential access points. Um, and it only takes one of them to fail and you're stuffed. Whereas you, you can trade that off for, okay, I can't see anywhere near as much because I'm just me, my ship or me and my plane or whatever, no access to external data inputs. But it's also much harder for anyone to get in and corrupt or attack your systems. There's another element to that though, and that is just the inherent delicacy of digital. Mm. Um, now, you know, uh, fantastic story out of wales where um is this wales, wales england or wales australia wales england mm -hmm. where oh. a rural village was constantly having serious broadband problems <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. so, this was... um, the problem started at seven o'clock in the morning mm. and ended at 10 o'clock every night and you know they various telcos had 
people had technicians in there ripping up wires, double checking, triple checking connections, testing speeds, couldn't identify the problem. Um, eventually, someone walked in with a um, basically an EMP detector, I suspect, and uh, managed to track it down to a rather antique television that when turned on, the old cathode ray tube was emitting um, far more of a broad spectrum of um, output than anticipated, which was cooking the local uh, internet transmission system. So here we have a television that took out an entire town's internet. Yeah. Yes. I am so, proud for that television. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, it, 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 on a more physical level as well, it's like we've all got these things, smartphones these days. Yeah. Mm. And now, even though this has a reasonable case to it, because this is the thing again, it, it illustrates the, the 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 delicacy of digital. Who has a smartphone these days and doesn't have some kind of case on it? Which kind of obviates yeah. a lot of the oh, we've made it really thin and light and everything. So, yes, you made it so thin and light we have to put a case on it because otherwise it's going to break. But never mind. But the thing is, we all know if I take this and I just chuck it at the wall, even though that's a stud wall and it's not particularly strong, the chances of this thing coming back intact are slim to none. Whereas but, my Nokia 3310, my old phone, yeah. would have gone through the wall and still be working fine. Exactly. Yeah. The Nokia. <laughs> but the, the, this is the thing. The Nokia 3310 is much less capable as as a smartphone compared to that thing but it'll still work through that kind of that kind of and yet, force and yet when i'm looking at the control rooms aboard the queen elizabeth mm. i'm seeing all these ultra thin 17 inch displays mm. yeah so I'm, again I'm not what, say what, anything at, about what point, that. <laughs> at what point do you I, I don't doubt that they've thought of these things mm. but you know um Again, you're not going to find out just how fragile they are until you get a physical, physically shot mm -hmm. at this. Seeing as I've seen exercise, I've seen things where people have physically hit them with very large hammers to try and demonstrate their strength. But there is also then there's the reason is it's the old question when you have some people talk about they go, why does it cost so much to buy an ashtray? And this is when days when they allowed smoking on ships versus a military one versus a civilian one. And the guy hits him with a hammer. And this is on an episode of West Wing. And it divides into three pieces instead of splintering. And he said, you know, he did literally that because we go into harm's way. So we have the, that's why it costs $150 to build an ashtray for the U.S. Navy versus $20 to build one for, you know, a civilian. Because the civilian one, it can smash in the glass and you everywhere. For us, it can't. I guess... But I do sometimes look at the military and go, you're trying to build the same to the same tolerances as you have in a civilian world. And you're going, yes, to do that, we cost us. Whereas if you just said right then, I could accept on my ship that it can be an inch thick rather than a few millimeters thick, you could probably for not mu for not as much that much cost, get the same size screen, same size functionality, a lot stronger, but a lot cheaper. Or you can put it in a case. Yes, which is actually what also again. If yes. you ever go around the mm. CIC, sometimes on mm -hmm. Alpine and Bulwark are an interesting one. If you're ever on them, <coughs> everything's in cases. Mm -hmm. It's cased up and, to the nth degree. But yeah, we we're already seeing um, talk and probably examples of bringing back things like signal lines and semaphore. They still because have because of the and bringing back sextants, you know, mm. um, because there's a growing recognition that actually no we can't always rely on gps to get us out of trouble no, no we can't always rely on you know that sat satellite uh, hookup to talk between ships the royal navy is so happy because it never let these things go away because it's so <laughs> traditional because uh, well we could say it's traditional but it's because also it was part of their training and no one wanted to break it up and now suddenly it's become good future proofing and the Ron is going, yeah, you this can't, is you can't hack around. a flag. <laughs> yeah, you can try and hack my flags. You're not going to. <laughs> Black Ops All right, so, so, so more analog is good. Mm. Yeah. To a, yeah. To a point. You need to balance it. You need that information connectivity because you need the information, but you also need to try and give yourself some protection. Yeah. So and it's, gonna go, it's, it's the backup system. So it's kind of like. You need Should to we... have a system that you can go, if the computer stops working, 
do I have a backup to that? Mm. You so can't allow good. yourself to have a single point of failure. A good analogy would actually be like a tank. Um, maybe not so much these days, but especially if you look at like a World War Two era tank combat, the tank commander would spend 99% of his time head up out of the cupola looking around. Yeah, he's horribly compromised the roof protection of the tank and his personal protection specifically, but that's kind of your digital battlefield. You're, you're accepting vulnerability in exchange for more data. But once artillery starts rattling down or heavy machine gun fire starts up, you duck down, button up the cupola, and you have to just deal with little viewing prisms. So you can't see as much. You're not as capable of directing the ship, but you're accepting the trade-off of more protection um, and just lasting longer versus not having as much data. And it's, I think it's, this is the same thing. You've got to have the analog backups because if things, if you can look at a digital system and you can say, right, I can identify a weakness, you can't assume your enemy's dumb enough not to know, have identified that weakness. And just because you know that there's a potential way that you could ruin this digital system, you don't want to because it's your digital system, but the enemy does, and they'll work out how to ruin it. And the last thing you want to do is to suddenly find half your digital stuff has suddenly stopped working and you have no idea why and no idea and no how backup. to get it back and no backup. I mean, you you can, to a certain extent, take a risk and say this system is so vital or the, the consequences of going to an analog backup are so dire that it's not really worth it. And you again, you can actually draw a naval a naval contrast to that with various navies in World War II, where a lot of navies kept the conning tower. That's kind of your analog backup for ship command. The British actually got rid of them. The King George V didn't re didn't have them, and they were removed on the refits of Renown and the, and the Queen Elizabeth that got fully modernised because the British captains just refused to use them. They just said, "No, we we won't go into a conning tower in battle because it's we're much better served." with the, that greater data input of being able to stand on the bridge and see what's going on and kind of if we're ever in a position where the bridge has got wiped out and we have to be in the conning tower we're probably going to die anyway so being in the conning tower doesn't actually help with that um which i mean it generally worked out i'm fairly sure there's a few people who were on the prince of wales bridge at denmark Strait who probably would have preferred having a conning tower but those are the risks that you run um, and I think this is this is going to be the thing with a lot of these uh, systems. People are going to have to take a view of can we realistically remain functional in combat if we lose this system, but there is a, a lesser system in place. If yes, we have the analog backup. If it's a case of, well, if this system goes down, we're dead anyway, it's probably not worth the extra weight and cost and expense of having an analog backup in place. I can't see DCTs, direct control cards, mm. suddenly making a re reappearance, for example. Let's face it, the uh, mm. tachyometric and optics just aren't going to cut it against yeah. the modern hypersonic and supersonic no. weapons and aircraft. So. No, no. But, it's, uh, but, uh, but uh, the, the, the flip side of that is you look at things like, um, well, actually you can see it in, in, a, lot, in a lot of the point defence systems. Some point defence systems like, say, uh, Kashtan or Phalanx or Goalkeeper, they have their own inbuilt radar. Now, yes, it's not the world's best radar because it's a tiny little, like, plant pot sized one. And you can link it into the ship's overall radar systems to get a much better result. But if it has to, it can go full automatic. Um, it's, that's kind of its, its hardwired backup. Whereas if you look at something like um, CRAM, it's a launcher. But if that launcher is cut off from the rest of the ship, it can't do anything. It has no data of its own. Mm. But that's because they've accepted that, whereas with a gun-based, or I suppose with the Russians, even with a gun-missile-based system like Kashtan, they've accepted that actually a small, compact radar, kind of like was present on things like Vanguard, Sextuple, Bofors, provides enough data to provide defense capabilities without reference to the larger, larger vessel, whereas on CRAM, they've decided that actually there's presumably they've decided that there isn't any radar small enough that they could fit on a sea ram launcher to make it worth doing um on, as i say on the basis of the fact that probably the range is so small that by the time it's given launch authorization to the missile the ship's already been hit and i think this is this this is this is the the, the design decision of like are we going to be dead anyway 
Um, uh, which is not this, a nice decision to have to make, but it is, uh, it is the sort of thing mm. with the backup systems. And there are various options for backup systems. And one of the things uh, I keep... Because your backup systems are always two options. You can either go for two of the top system, or you can accept a lesser system which you can more easily protect. Yeah. And that's always your option is you do you have multiple of the top system or do you have a lesser and the thing is I've been uh, it, it's one of the things when you start talking to people it, one of the interesting conversations I had about the type 31 because my often debate and this is something I do enjoy in Battlestar Galactica they usually have multiple gun turrets these days, multi-gun turrets are in the sort of the, the, the very much the minority. It's usually a single gun system, like sort of the Americans, and well, going for more during World War II than everyone else. And I'm sort of looking at modern guns, and I'm going, we keep going with these single guns in these turrets. Uh, yes, because we prefer to have a second turret, so we have uh, that, into, uh, so that sort of reduces our points of failure. I can accept that, and that's fine at the moment. But I have a feeling in the future, you might well get back to a system where they'll be going, right, and we need a multi-gun system, because you need to increase range uh, your rate of fire, and if you lose one turret, you're losing 50% of your firepower, whereas if you, you know, you, you go down below such a certain level, it's... The whole thing is, our systems, I would say, at the moment, and one of the interesting things which I learned, I was sort of, go when I was going through with Battlestar, um, especially when I was in the deadlock sort of game and I was doing my sort of testing so I could be familiar with that universe. The issues that come up with weapon systems when they have limited arcs of fire and you have very few of them and you lose them and suddenly you've got a big hole. And this all works fine on paper in theory when you're not fighting a war. But once you're into an actual combat scenario, suddenly that becomes a big problem. You know, the lack of a backup, the lack of a, a second system. Uh, I think you two, uh, both my colleagues have seen, and anyone who's on, been near my YouTube account has probably seen it. I did do a small rant about the Corvette, Manticore Corvette, in the universe. Because I love the Corvette in so many ways. It's the perfect ship which I would normally be picking up. But... For some reason, it's what got one gun forward, one gaff, a gun aft, and instead of having them top and bottom, so they could do 360. Why? Because if you're only going to carry two guns, that makes sense, because then if one breaks, then you've still got coverage. Yes, you haven't got coverage for your top, and you've only got coverage for your bottom, but it, you then spin the ship round. That's far easier than dealing with any of the other, especially if you've got your own internal gravity. It doesn't matter what way up the ship is. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, what does matter is if you suddenly have no gun can fire aft, and you've got to keep turning the ship round. Spinning the ship is far easier than turning the ship. And it's the same with modern warships. I'd rather not spin them, honestly. That would probably <laughs> cause a lot of trouble. I, but, I thought you quite liked the idea of the, um, the, the pod systems that would allow that. Well, you could... Yes, that, the pod systems I do love, but that's turning a warship very fast, not yeah. spinning a warship on its <laughs> central axis and turning it upside down. Um, but, you know... The, I do like the Type 31 design because it has got guns for and two guns for or two guns forward, one gun aft. And they, the uh, the most further most 57 millimeter forward actually has kind of, because of its position quite a good coverage aft, not directly aft, but quite good coverages. And sort of all the guns have mutual. Coverage. I am not keen when you have this idea of we have one phalanx on one side and one phalanx on the other side, and therefore if a phalanx goes down because of just mechanical failure suddenly we have to turn the ship entirely around to be able to bring a phalanx to bear to protect the ship mm. i mean you even saw you even saw that in in the second world war to be honest because if you look at the anti-aircraft suites of pre-war cruisers the anti-aircraft guns are down one side down the other side almost like miniaturized versions of world war one cruisers where broadside guns were all the rage but there's a reason that main battery guns moved into centerline turrets 
on cruisers and you look at the mid to late war designs where the hull allowed for it you saw them pelacing like things like say on the Des Moines class, well, the Des Moines class is immediately post but like on the Baltimore class or the Cleveland class, you saw they, they put a twin five inch turret on the center line, super firing above um, B or X turret, because that meant that, yeah, you you could have six, let's say six turrets, six five, twin five inch turrets, but you could get um, four of them on any on any broadside and three, three, four and three, four and aft, which was a lot better than if you just stuck three on each side um mm-hmm. and yeah you, you it's these kind of things you have to think about but sort of yeah it's re- when you're talking about the practicalities of things say it's, it, you've got to come down to what is the likely circumstance involved i mean i i, I like to sort of use the the prosaic example is where i live yeah uh, obviously it, when it comes to say, water it makes a lot of sense to make sure the house is waterproof it's got a good solid roof on it and everything because let's face it it's england it rains a lot and being on the top of a, a ridge you get an awful lot of rain and weather that doesn't actually translate across the rest of london that makes sense but it makes no sense for me to invest in anti-flood defenses at all because it doesn't matter how hard it rains it doesn't matter how hard it pours it doesn't matter what's going on short of a bit literal biblical flood if at any there... point i find myself going I really wish I'd invested in flood defences for my house. That means the country's under about 400 feet of water and I've got much bigger things to worry about than the fact my house is about to be flooded. You do have that massive sunken wreck full of explosives just down the coast. Yeah, but there's... Yes, but he and I are both high enough up. We don't mind. If that goes off, if the blast wave somehow is big enough to send a shockwave of water this far, the fact that my house has some anti-flood measures that it is not going to save me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's... it's, And this is the thing, it's the same thing with the ship. It's like, you have have to be sensible with your backups of going, okay, we could have this backup, we could have this backup to this backup, and we could have the backup to the backup of the backup, but sooner or later you've got to ask yourself, if we're at the position where we're using the backup of the backup of the backup just exactly what kind of situation are we in and is this actually going to help in any way shape or form and at some point the chance the answer is going to be probably not i mean this is this is why i think to a certain extent um even things like the torpedo defense systems you saw on the old battleships have kind of mostly gone away in everything but a carrier um everything but i mean it's like you look at like a an Arleigh Burke or a Type 45 or um, a Freem or whatever, they, they've they got a degree of anti-torpedo defences. But for their size, if you look at the anti-torpedo defences that you'd have on a Treaty-era cruiser, compared to the, the physical anti-torpedo defences you've got on a modern ship, they're practically nothing. But that's because people have looked at it and gone, yeah, there might be a slight amount of damage mitigation, but to be perfectly honest, if a Mark 48 or equivalent russian or chinese equipment detonates under the keel having put 400 tons into into side broadside but torpedo bulges is not going to help us in the slightest so there's no point same applies to build armor doesn't it so yeah. yeah yeah it's it's yes in theory it has a a protective value against certain scenarios but those scenarios are so vanishingly unlikely and if they do occur you probably are already dead in three very interesting and painful ways that there's no point wasting that that displacement put it towards something that can prevent you getting into that situation in the first place thanks for listening to part one of bilge pumps deep dive into battlestar galactica in part two we look at the prospects for flak emp and freaking laser beams escort clear zone intact Your life is no longer yours to throw away. Just give me one good shot. Fresh on strike. Firing on target. For Colonial Fleet. For the 12 Colonies. Nothing but the rain. Oh.